If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that you're a hunter or you just enjoy the great outdoors. If you value your ability to hunt, now is the time to step up. There have been countless efforts to vilify hunters and denounce the legitimacy of the science-based wildlife management model. There's no science to this stance, and it is solely emotionally charged. We don't want to see what happened with the grizzly hunt replay itself again with the remaining large carnivores or big game species. It's a slippery slope, folks. We need to stand together. Now is the time for hunters to be united across all organizations and show our combined support. Please go to wildsheepsociety.com forward slash act now and follow the steps. It doesn't take much time and it will help save the future of hunting. This applies to residents and non-residents alike. Please let's use our voice and be heard. On with the show, folks. This is episode 16 of the Wilderness Locals podcast. On this episode, I talked with Mark and Curtis Hall from the Hunter Conservationist podcast. We talk about how they got started and quickly moved to talk about conservation and the current efforts and social issues. This podcast is brought to you by Kafaru International, the toughest hunting gear on the planet, bar none. Frontiersman gear, high quality, completely custom, handmade knives in the heart of the peace country. And as always, we're brought to you by Just Shooting Arrows, DC's premier archery shop. So basically, I want to start this thing off by uh, thanking both of you guys for for everything you're doing and in, in the space right now. And you're you're helping a lot of guys out, and you're giving a lot of guys um, the I don't know if ammo is the right word, but the ammo to have these conversations with. Um, the non-hunter or anti-hunter or however you want to label it, but the uninitiated and um, you guys are giving people a lot of, a lot of, a lot of data to, to have these intelligent conversations with people. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I kind of see it like we're, you know, we're providing a perspective. We're providing some analysis analyses of, you know, things that we're seeing and, you know, some balance to the arguments that are being presented out there and, you know, getting people um, to sort of see things a certain way. Sometimes things get introduced into the public forums in a very nuanced way, um, like a social license to hunt thing. And so we're kind of, you know, raising the flag on those. And, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot bigger network out there, you know, behind this than maybe people think. And, and, uh, there's some comfort in that, you know, we've managed to make connections with people across the academic world, scientists, people that are involved in journal publications to people in places all over the world that are interested in this stuff. So, got a quite a network of people sort of behind the scenes that are that we're having these conversations with floating stuff back and forth people get alerted to something happening and the call goes out and papers get sent around and so so it's not just us there's there's a pretty good network helping us yeah i mean with this latest um wild sheep society call for action. I mean, I, I sure notice a lot of guys, um, picking up the slack and getting in there, you know, got guys that you wouldn't normally hear from. Yeah. We're seeing that as well. Um, behind the scenes again, mm-hmm. people writing into us or messaging us privately, um, that are saying how much they're inspired you know, by some of the messages and, you know, people that are saying like normally they're very shy or they got into hunting. They didn't think that this was going to be what they got into, but they're saying like, Hey, I'm going to go meet with my, my MLA. What should I say? You know, it's, <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's happening. And, you know, Curtis is in much more touch with kind of the, the demographic, um, yeah. you know, so yeah. he, he has, has a lot more conversations with the people that really make a difference. Nice. That's awesome. And I mean, that, that's, um, that's a good spot for us to turn here and maybe get some of your guys's backstory. Um, cause you guys do do so much. And like I said, you guys give everybody so much ammo, but what, what brought you guys to the, 
I guess what, what I'll get there, but I, I kind of want to hear about the, the evolution of the, uh, of the hall boys journey here. Uh, we'll start with Mark and <laughs> how, how did, how did you get into hunting? Was it something that you were born into Mark? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was born into a hunting and trapping family. Um, cool. Hall starts with an H. So does hunting and so does <laughs> hockey. <laughs> that's, yeah. like, that's the three. It's like a ranch, the three H's. Um, it's a real Canadian podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I definitely, you know, definitely was born into, um, you know, a hunting family. I was born Christmas Eve and nice. the very first possession I ever had in the world was a toy hunting rifle that my grandfather brought to the hospital Christmas day. When the family <laughs> saw me for the first time. That's but, awesome. You know, growing up as a kid, you know, my passion became nature and animals and plants and, and everything. And, you know, it was, it was a big part of me. Um, and, I think I was probably the first hall boy, uh, you know, of, of my generation that my family thought was never going to become a hunter just mm. because of how much I cared, you know, for this stuff. And, uh, you know, I did obviously become a hunter and, you know, started going out with my dad and it, and, and my grandfather in my teens, I moved away from home. And my grandfather sort of became my primary hunting partner, um, for years and years. And, you know, we had a special, special connection there. And yeah. I mean, it was, it was a natural evolution. I think it's the, it's the standard probably story, um, for people, at least of my generation born yeah, into yeah. the family, you start getting drug along and you just kind of, kind of fall into it. But, you know, evolution wise, you know, I never. I never lost that, that passion and compassion for all things, yeah. you know, uh, wild. I mean, I remember as a kid, one summer I spent days in, in, during the summer holidays in a lot out behind the house that I lived in with some screwdrivers and a hammer and stuff, chiseling the pavement apart because there was this little tree that was growing up <laughs> out of the crack in the pavement. And I knew it wasn't going to live. And yeah. so I had to do something about it. And, and I chiseled this thing out and it was in a coffee can. It ended up going from Golden to, to Houston and Northern BC to Smithers in Northern BC. And then finally back to the Kootenays, you know, where it was planted at, a, at, at our summer cottage kind of thing. And, nice. you know, I mean, I think all kids, you know, do do stuff like that, but you know, even as a growing adult, uh, we were on a camping trip one time and there was a little mouse, you know, got into the, the lime that was for the outhouse where we were staying. And mm -hmm. I spent a whole entire day washing this little guy off and washing it out of his eyes with my saline solution and drying him <laughs> off by the heater in the trailer and until he was good to take back in the woods. And, and uh, you know, it's, that's, that's who I am as a person. I'm still a hunter. Um, yeah. even though I hold that, that bond with animals and I pass that on to the kids, hopefully, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a really important point. Um, just in general, I mean, I think a lot of hunters are, I mean, the, the amount of care and, and love and admiration that we have for these animals, it, it, it's, um, I think trying to explain it to somebody that doesn't hunt, I don't think they can understand it. You know, um, uh, I, I don't think they can understand how, how we could care so much about these things and still, um, turn them into food. Right. Yeah. Well, that's one of the classic arguments. How can you say you love wildlife and then kill it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, for sure. I, I mean, it's but just, you know, e even, you know, sort of, you know, if you kind of want to talk about evolution and in, in my journey, yeah, you know, that's a story that probably lots of people are going to relate to, you know, you know what I just said, it's not, it's not atypical. Um, but when the kids, when the kids came about, um, 
that really changed, really changed hunting for me. Um, cause both the kids, we were the ones where everything went wrong in the delivery room. Oh yeah. Cur- Curtis was an emergency C-section. Um, you know, his mom was having problems. His heart rate was dropping and it ended up being an emergency cesarean section. Yep. You get thrown into stuff that you don't expect like life and death stuff. And then two years later, when Curtis's sister came along, uh, it was the same story, but it was worse. It was like, it yeah. was much more like things were happening and, and going to happen now. And, uh, I, they weren't, they didn't let me in the operating room for her because it was so serious. And, um, you know, I did the dad thing where I sat out in the waiting room for two hours, not knowing if either of them were alive. And, yeah. uh, <clears throat> several months later, I kind of had, I don't know what you call it, a flashback or just all of that pent up fear struck me um and kind of had a big breakdown and from that point on i really had a trouble with the whole life and death thing and yeah. uh I, I quit hunting I, hmm. I quit hunting for almost two years and it wasn't until you know the kids started to kind of like you know be toddler size where i could take it out where where it really brought it back for me but um yeah, yeah it's just had trouble facing that whole life and death thing and being, being the cause of it. And so that, that might be a little, maybe a few, few people will relate to that, but. Um, oh yeah, yeah for sure. That's a backstory. Yeah. No kidding. Um, I mean, I, I, I already, I sent you a photo of my eldest daughter out in the woods who <laughs> is about Curtis's age in that story when uh when you got back out into the woods about four so no huh. it, it it hits home for me for sure um and i think that's something that a lot of guys um that are getting into hunter a lot of guys that start hunting as adults like i did um you have to wrap your you have to wrap your mind around it um big time totally yeah, yeah. kids change you Oh yeah. So Curtis, you, um, from four years old on, it sounds like you were dad's hunting partner. Yeah. So I, uh, obviously grew up in a hunting family. <clears throat> I would argue some of my earliest memories were out hunting and fishing as a, as a young kid. And basically from the time that I can remember, I, uh, I desperately wanted my own hunting license. I wanted to have my own <laughs> hunting license, just like my dad and just like my grandfather. It was the one thing on my mind. Yeah. Um, so at 10, I took my, my core, my hunter trainer course, which is mm-hmm. the earliest possible time I could take it. I was sitting there <laughs> counting down to 10 years old. I was, I think I was the youngest person in, in the class by <laughs> pro- yeah. probably 10 or 15 years. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, uh, anyway, so I took, took my course and to this day, it's still more, I, I, I still remember that feeling of excitement more than when I got my driver's license or my high school, <laughs> my college graduation, that, that moment walking out of the, uh, of the exam, holding my, uh, my, at, at that time, it wasn't a FWID number. It was your, uh, just your hunter's number, but holding yeah. that and walking out to the truck was, was the most exciting day <clears throat> that, uh, that, you know, I, I, I still don't think I've had a day where it matched that <laughs> level of excitement. <laughs> he was, he was not going to hunt under the youth license. There was just oh, yeah. no <laughs> way. <laughs> That's awesome. How, how old are you, Curtis? Um, 25. 25. Nice. Cool. So I, I'm, I'm between you guys in age then. Um, cool, man. So, so, um, cue the adventures of Curtis and Mark. You guys, obviously you guys are from the coots, right? Yeah. Yes. And, uh, there's lots of hunting in the coots. Um, so there must be some good stories there that stand out to both you guys. Oh man. There's how long you got. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right Year, um, years and years of yeah hunting so, season uh, so uh, you know uh mark your your profile picture on instagram you're holding the bugle tube to your face there and uh 
you guys oh, yeah, live kind of last year. There you go. You guys, you guys live in sort of, um, what a lot of people would argue the heart of elk country in BC. Um, and Curtis, you were a young guy that your dad was taking along at one point. So maybe you guys got into some elk. Yeah, we've bumped into a few here and there. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you want to maybe talk about your, uh, your first elk you got on the ground or something like that? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the first, actually the only elk that I've ever got, um, nice. I actually had a, uh, I, I drew a cow elk permit. We had, uh, back when we had our, our, our cow season, it was for, uh, the Rocky mountain trench, uh, an area we call zone X. So it's basically in between the, the front side of the Rockies and the start of the Purcells it kind of runs yep. all the way down up from the States all the way up. And, uh, it was below 1100 meters. And, uh, we used, we used to go out every September, kind of the whole family. And we'd, we'd camp out in an area and, uh, kind of not the elk hunting we do now. It was very much like you'd go out for the morning, putt around, come back, hang out at camp, play yeah. some cribbage, and then you'd go out for the evening. Definitely not the, uh, the elk hunting we do now where we're in the mountains at the end of the elk hunting trip you've lost 15 pounds in sweat <laughs> yeah <laughs> a little bit more mellow but um yeah I, we were kind of sitting over looking over this little uh little kind of lowland area and right towards evening and uh herd of elk came walking out and um we were kind of watching them trying to pick out the cows from the calves and you know because we didn't i didn't we didn't want to shoot a, a cow with a calf or shoot a young calf yeah. cause, um so anyways we we were kind of sitting there and i'm all lined up and my dad's like okay he's like you know whatever the, the third one third one from the back he's like that one looks like it's a, a year and a half old calf you know it's it's not a cow it doesn't have a calf that'll that'll be the one so anyways yeah pulled the trigger and went up and couldn't find it for probably an hour. It was into dark. Yeah. I phoned everybody up and this was kind of the first time that I had like shot something and it hadn't gone down right away. Oh yeah. So anyway, so we had the, uh, had the, the whole family out there and we're all looking around with headlamps and flashlights. And I remember walking and, and I was just kind of thinking, I'm like, man, I, I smell elk. And all of a sudden <laughs> I went out and was like, Hey, we got an elk over here. <laughs> uh, great, great shot but you know even even with a good shot it, it kind of goes a little further than you're expecting and oh yeah big sigh of relief and yeah that was that was my first elk that's awesome that's awesome so you guys are getting after some uh big mountain hunts. how sorry some big mountain hunts now it sounds like yeah definitely especially um the archery season uh, the early archery season for elk is, uh, is kind of the des destination elk hunt now, f you know, for, for us, it's just, uh, it's yeah, awesome. it's an amazing time to be out there. Um, especially in the high mountains, uh, because virtually nobody hunts elk, you know, in the high mountains in the back in the archery season. So it yep. is like truly like you're just by yourself back there and, you know, the elk populations are down, um, yeah, here in yeah. the Kootenays, but, uh, it's just, it's phenomenal in places like just bugling every day bulls, just like, it's just, it's epic. And I think making the transition from rifle hunting to archery hunting causes you to be a completely different hunter. Yeah. Um, and your, your bubble you know, drops from like, oh, this entire basin or this entire draw <laughs> to like, okay, like from here to that tree. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's like your, your sphere of what you're hunting <laughs> in. And uh, yeah, it really, it really forces you to become, you know, a better hunter. And, you know, one of the uh, really cool stories I kind of have, um, and, and this is an evolution in hunting that, uh, you know, until you start, to, I'm 54. Yeah. Um, but my, my understanding and my way of interacting with animals and hunting in the outdoors has changed. Um, as I get older, you, 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 you tend to reflect and look at things 
quite differently. Um, and I would actually sort of say in a spiritual way Yeah. and things have really changed for me in the outdoors to the point where like, I honestly feel like, like things that are, are happening in my relationship with animals out there is, is for any better way of describing it is like, a, it's, it's not of this world. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's very different. And, you know, for example, uh, a few years ago before the archery season, I was scouting a new route into a basin that I wanted to hunt and I cut a trail in by myself. It was like super thick cedar understory, spent all day cutting my way through and ended up on a little ridge as there's breaking into kind of the subalpine forest. Um, it was starting to open up a little bit and I reached a spot where I was basically okay. Like I don't have to cut trail from here any farther. Like I can just like work my way through the trees. It's, it's no sense in going any farther. And mm -hmm. I, I was exhausted, just soaked in sweat. This was like July or something like that. And, yeah. uh, sat down on this log and, um, it was in an old cedar forest quite high up on the mountain above the highest of where they've logged. And so it's like that typical cedar forest where it's just like forest floor. Like there's no, like not a lot of shrubs, just that dead litter layer. And then these yeah. old cedar trees and it's quite, it's quite dark even during the sunny part of the day. And there was that little beam of light coming down out of the trees and it hit this spot on the ground right beside me. And I was looking at what it was, what the sun was lighting up and it was a rock. And I was looking at this rock and I was basically saying that rock does not belong here naturally. Mm -hmm. it, there's something different about it. And during my career working in the natural resource sectors, um, a lot of the, you know, some of the work that I had to do was taking out archaeologists to look at the areas that we were planning to do stuff on and they would look for signs of archaeological sites. And so cool. I was with them when we found stuff. I was in places where they discovered things that they never knew that there were people there ever, like in valleys, like for the first time. Yeah. And so I really got to understand like what human made artifacts look like. And that's what this stone was. I recognized the biface on the end of this big stone as having been a tool that was made by human hands. Nice. And what it, what it was, is it was what was called a crack hammer. And yeah. it was a big stone that was shaped and lashed to a big heavy branch. And it was used like a sledgehammer to smash open the big bones of an animal. <sighs> so I felt I was sitting in a spot where people had probably butchered an animal thousands of years ago. They forged the tools right there, probably yeah. left them laying there, you know, when they, they packed away. I went back there that hunting season, went through that exact spot and I went up onto the basin past there. And the second morning of the archery season, I encountered a bull elk that I bugled in so close he was standing in the bushes beside me with his head laid back and I was just frozen because you know, <laughs> he had a bunch of alder behind me and I could see his eyeball rolled back in his head because he he was that sort of like there's something here and he's like freaked out and the whites of his eye is right there and his head's laid back and he's like breathing heavy and his eyeballs rolled back and I'm basically looking at it like eight feet away yeah so, and, and he turned and left and I just, I had this really strange sense that from the moment in the summertime that I was basically shown that artifact on the ground that to me told me, this is a place you need to hunt because an animal was harvested here one time. That elk came to me that September, September 2nd but I didn't harvest it and it left and it left me with the feeling like it came to me 
but it wanted to show me where it went. And it wanted to show me where those elk went in order to spend the day, which was in like an incredibly steep, nasty piece of country. Yeah. And it was almost like I was being told, you need to know this information. You're, you're not meant to harvest an elk right now, but all of this is leading you because we need to show you something. And the following year, opening morning of the archery season, just about 500 yards away, the bull walked out eight yards from me and I harvested it. Nice. And it just, it's an aspect of hunting that has evolved to me that there are things out there that are giving me signals and telling me things. And sometimes there's, sometimes they're offerings to a hunter yeah. and other times it's imparting knowledge that I'm supposed to do something with. I'm somehow supposed to take that back and tell people about something that I've been told is important to the animals. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just made hunting a whole different thing for me. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to argue. Um, I guess that's not the right word. It's hard to convey the connection that we as hunters get with the, the natural world from our experiences and our, our close encounters and getting into it with these animals. I mean, I, um, like, uh, and I think it was 2018, 2018, I shot an elk that turned out to, we found, I found out a year later, it, it didn't actually kill the elk. Um, but I shot an elk in 2019 and the course that he took to, get to safety from where that was, um, gave me a roadmap to the area that I hunt to this day. Like he hit every wallow on that mountain. Um, and it's like, it, it's not as beautiful as your story, but, um, uh, man, it's crazy. The, the, the connection to that area. Now, I, I honestly have a hard time hunting elk in any other area. Cause I'm like, Oh, I got, I got to, I got to go back there. I have so much invested and I have, I have such a strong feeling about this place, you know? And I, and I think that's the key thing, you know, when I've shared this story with people before, I think you just said it, you have a feeling. And what I tell people is, is just, you have feelings when you're out there, like sensations, like something, uh, like something is giving you a signal. Something's telling you to go left rather than right. It's like, yeah. don't, don't, cause we're, we're in a culture and a society and guys and all this kind of stuff that we're supposed to just sort of like, you know, ah, you know, that, that stuff's not real. Right. And so I just tell people to, to be open to that. Mm -hmm. When you feel those sensations, like stop for a moment and just, it's a feeling. It's not like some letters appear on the snow in front of you or something like that. Right. But it's a feeling <laughs> and just be open to what you think that means. Because yeah. I honestly believe there is something so ancient in the relationship of hunters and wild animals that I do honestly feel in some way that sometimes some of us are meant to be a conduit between the two worlds. Sometimes yeah. it's for food and sometimes it's for other, other reasons. And I just tell people to be, to be open to that and just explore it because it can completely change who you are and what hunting means to you. If you just kind of soak it in. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head too. When just now, when you said, you know, it's something so ancient and I, I think a lot of it is, um, hardwired into it, hardwired into us rather. Um, I, I, I mean, there's definitely people that get into these areas and they know what to do without thinking about it. My, uh, my, my hunting mentor, Ronnie is like that. We'll go into spots that he's never been to before. And like, he just knows what to do. You know, he's just, it's like wired into him and, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's cool. That's very cool. And the other component of it too, I think is, um, a, a lot of guys and guys like us that spend a lot of time in the woods, you get, you start to get that connection with the natural world, whether it's, you know, spiritual or whatever. Um, 
you start to understand how stuff works. You know, even if you just go out there and hang out, you know, you learn stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yep, yeah absolutely. And if you, if, if, if you pay attention, I've kind of, I've started doing it the last, the last few seasons that I've, I've started paying more attention to those kind of gut feelings you have. And the amount of times where you have that little thing, you'd be like, you'll be sitting somewhere and you'll kind of look over and you'll be like, I should be sitting over there. Yeah. But it's like, ah, no, I'm, I'm just going to sit here. And then sure enough, something happens, something comes, steps out and you're like, oh man, if I would have been like right there where I had that gut feeling, like I probably would have had a successful hunt. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, yeah, I've been paying attention to, to those type of feelings and the, the, the that sort of, um, voice that guiding voice and if you, if you really start paying attention to it it's it's actually unbelievable how many little situations like that you're just like ah you know what maybe you should be over there maybe you should go up this ridge maybe you know go 20 feet further and call like you know all of that and it's it's kind of once you open up to it and and start paying attention it's like man there's there's a lot of little kind of gut feelings pulling you around Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you guys think that part of it is a uh, adaptation of all of your experiences up to that point? Well, I Just, think that that is a factor. Um, definitely. Um, you know, your, your hunting intuitions, your instincts and stuff are cumulative, you know, over yeah. your lifetime. Um, you do, like you say, accumulate things and you go into an area and, you know, you read the situation, whether it's like weather, time of the year, whatever, and you just have a certain kind of intuition that it's sort of like, you know, over there, or over there, or wait down here or something like that, or let's mm -hmm. work this piece of area. Yeah. I, th I think there's, there's there's a lifetime of, um, of yeah, you built can, up mental model. You kind of gain the tools and the experience to allow you to be in the right place at the right time. But there's still just those offside moments where it was like, it doesn't matter the experience of a person or anything. You're like, that was just too coincidental or too yeah. to be like, to, to yeah. be like my, my skill or my knowledge, like my, the, my girlfriend got her first buck, whitetail buck this fall. Nice. We, we'd hunted a few days and, um, <clears throat> we kind of just were bummed out the one morning. Um, we had a, uh, a friend of hers from college. Uh, her boyfriend actually came up from Vancouver. He wanted to be a part, you know, he's like, I want to get my hunting stuff. I want to see what it's about. So we actually had him with us and, Cool. kind of worked this one area and we're like, ah, like, you know, everything seemed good. I was doing everything right. I was making all the right decisions, but it was like, we just couldn't get in. And we're like, you know what, let's just kind of go back to the truck and, you know, we'll just go somewhere else for the evening. And I was kind of at a fork in the road and I'm like, am I going to go back over here or am I going to go over here? And I'm like, let's go this way. And I started pulling up to where I wanted to go. And then the, the very last second I was like, nah, let's just zip over this way. Yeah. So I just kind of cranked hard over the other way and drove down that road. And sure enough, there's a white tail buck standing. <laughs> and it was, uh, just kind of like, man, if I would have gone the way we were going, we wouldn't, uh, yeah. wouldn't have seen him. And anyway, so we got out and she made a good shot and, and, got this buck and we found out actually after when we were skinning it that the day before somebody else had shot at that buck and shot his back leg and he was injured Oof. and he probably wasn't gonna make it through the winter if not leading up to winter nice yeah so there was just that something that kind of guided us right at the last second it's like nope you need to go this way yeah and the buck didn't move, didn't like, he just stood there and it was kind of like, you know, she was meant to harvest that buck at that yeah. time. 
Yeah, for sure. There, the, there's no denying that, that stuff happens. I mean, um, my my hunting partner Chad is like that man. He he's like, I'm like, which way? He just like looks at the map and points, and then we're we're into the elk. <laughs> he he he's the intuition guy for sure. Um, oh, then there's then there's people out there that just got horseshoes. You know where you are. It's like, oh you man, work, yeah, you work your ass off, and then it's like you're like, really? You just like, yeah, went out and. I was like, yeah, this, this spring when we were doing our, uh, our turkey hunt, yeah, kind of like, you know, we just, we decided to do a little bit of filming for this turkey hunt and we we're like, ah, you know, the last five years in a row, you know, my dad's got a turkey opening morning, almost like pretty much every single year. I'm coming hunting with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but so we're like, oh man, this thing's kind of in the bag. Like we know where there's turkeys. It's going to be kind film. of a short, little short film. <laughs> eight, eight days later <laughs> we're still out there hunting and uh, every single day that we were out either i would get a text or he would get a text from one of our friends yeah hey, i got my turkey this morning oh yeah we got our what? turkey this morning it's like holy oh, like everyone was getting turkey <laughs> like, between the two of us there's like you know 30 years of collective turkey hunting knowledge and it's like man we just can't see <laughs> I had friends well, who had just started hunting their first year and they're like, Oh, we got our turkey today. And it's like, what the hell is he? <laughs> well, we're uh we're heading your guys' way um this year for uh spring turkey, most likely. So I'll need some right of those on. horseshoes that we just talked about because I am not a horseshoe <laughs> guy. I am a guy that kills stuff by being in the field a ton. Um <laughs> there's not a lot of luck over I'm, here. I'm I'm the same way. Uh, I'm like my, my hunting career has been like my math career. And it's like <laughs> the only reason I got a, I got a C and was able to pass. Cause it's just, I worked my ass off. I yeah. had no, yeah. no talent or luck. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I relate to that big time, but, um, so you, you boys are big into turkeys, hey? Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's not yeah, a story just, you hear often in BC. It seems like I only know a couple guys. I mean, I, I, I'm down in region two here, um, but I only know a couple guys that make the trip to go chase turkeys every year. You know, I'm pretty much the type of person where if they said, okay, y'all have to pick one thing and that's all you could hunt the rest of your life. Cause there's just not enough to go around. Yeah. I would pick a wild turkey. That's awesome. Like there's just, there's a connection there. I love it. Uh, it's just, I love the calling aspect. I love being over decoys. Uh, everything about it is just so amazing. And when you finally get a turkey, it's like, you don't go, oh my God, what did I just do? I'm like, eight kilometers from the truck <laughs> you're just like you're just like oh yeah i'll just carry it out right like it's 40 pounds <laughs> that's so awesome the the last bull elk that i got in the archery season was two days to get it out of the the mountains right so oh, yeah. worrying about grizzly bears when you go back the next day and stuff where turkeys is just like whoop, here we go yeah but uh no no i absolutely <laughs> love it so we got a turkey film coming out here pretty quick and uh and uh turkey hunting workshop so well i can't wait for that i might have to figure out how to get to your turkey workshop so it's going to be online well i'm online so that's perfect i'll be in it so <laughs> so will chad and wacy listen up boys we need to learn no nope, you'll uh you'll right get the notice here pretty quick but yeah right no, love, love turkey hunting cool so you mentioned archery a couple times did did both you guys dive down that rabbit hole that rabbit hole's deep that one has me um <laughs> real bad i i did for sure um kind of later later in my hunting career in order to take advantage of the early elk season and yeah. um yeah love it love it i still switch back to rifle later in the yeah. year in the year um just because it's like archery is a little bit of a kind of like a a vow of like not hurting anything sometimes you know it's like that's you know it's a whole whole lot of like you know close encounters but you just can't 
can't make the shot you or get, whatever. You, you and, get into archery season and you haven't hunted since the spring and you're kind of like in the oh monk yeah. phase. You're like, oh, I'm going to be all zen and be the the ultimate warrior hunter with the bow and then you get to the end of elk season and you're like, uh, okay, if I keep this up, I'm going to go hungry this winter. So yeah. Bye. Time for the 338. <laughs> but, uh, um, no, I, I relate. I, I hunt elk season every year with my bow from the first to the ninth. And last year it's like, you're right too. You're totally rusty. And <laughs> I pulled like rookie move 101 last year. We called a, we called a nice six point bull. Well, not nice. He was young, but he was a good bull. Ha- had six points, so he's good, right? <laughs> but we called called this bull in, and total rust, rusty move, right? Got got him. He's face on, like like um, would have been a frontal shot. And I was like, oh, I'll just chirp at him. And I'll just shoot him because he'll turn broadside. So I like throw a, a chirp over my shoulder. He turns broadside, and then I re- remembered. I was like, oh yeah, I needed to draw my bow before I chirped. I'm done. <laughs> but yeah. no the problem yeah. i have now when uh when the archery season's over is if i pick up the rifle i still hunt like i'm archery hunting so i'm still trying to get myself into positions where it's like 20 and 25 yard shots yeah and it's kind of like i'm like what's the point of having a rifle with a scope <laughs> on it well, that's, I mean, I, I relate to that big time. I mean, I, I spend most of my time hunting with a bow and last year I did a hunting trip with my, my hunting mentor, Ronnie, that I mentioned earlier. And we were in big open country and working the glass and we get it, we get it, we get in on this nice four point that I ended up killing, but I'm like, look at him. I'm like, we should circle cause of the wind. He's looking at me. He's like, what is wrong with you? Circle cause of the wind, get like within 200 yards and kill that thing, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, right. I don't have to sneak up to 40 yards. Okay. Yeah. No, it's uh it it is a big mind shift, that's for sure. Yeah, no kidding. So from uh so, so, so there was obviously uh at some point you guys started um the hunter conservative, the the hunt I'm sorry, my tongue's all tied up here. The hunter conservationist. Um how did that come about? Who started it? And what's the story there? Oh, well, you, you kind of started off with uh, writing those few articles a couple of years before we kind of kicked the whole thing yeah, off. Yeah, that's right. That was, that's uh, right. What would you call the, ar- the articulate hunter? Or no, it was still like called, that. it was called hunter conservationist. Um, I had a blog you know, was writing articles and putting, putting them out there just to kind of like test the waters to see how, how are people going to respond to kind of my way of looking at like some of these issues, um, conservation issues. Um, it kind of like was right at the time when the whole grizzly bear debate hit, I did a lot of writing about that and, and, I got a lot of really great feedback and really positive things from folks just sort of saying like, it's a very different, it's a very different take on, on what is traditionally out there on a lot of these topics. And so that kind of gave me the, the encouragement to say to Curtis, like, let's, let's kind of move this forward. And, you know, I'd been on a couple of podcasts, um, on rookie hunter, I was starting to follow Dylan Ayers at Eat Wild BC and, you know, they sort of became, you know, inspirations to, to, to sort of say, let's, let's get into this podcasting thing. Cause it's a pretty cool vehicle nice. um, to start, to start communicating. And so, yeah, we, we moved that forward. We had a lot of um, support um, from Mike Patterson at the Rookie Hunter. He's a professional sound technician, um, and getting us set up with equipment and, you know, and all, all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, just kind of finally just jumped into it. And, and, you know, the, the premise behind the Hunter Conservationist podcast, you know, for us was, was this huge gap that we saw during the grizzly bear debate that was going on in that there was no 
forum or voice or somebody with the tools communicating to a larger audience on behalf of hunters, you know, other than just the written, the written articles, but none of, none of the, none of the popular brands or individuals in the States really cared because it wasn't, it wasn't America. And I saw a tremendous amount of hunters in British Columbia trying to reach out, you know, to these people down in the States going like, Hey, you got to, you got to help us out here. You got to talk about this. You need to whatever. And it was just like radio silence, right? Yeah. Falling on deaf Um, ears. After the decision was made, then it was like everybody down there was like jumped on the bandwagon and they had an opinion and they blamed British Columbians for voting and and all this kind of stuff. And it was like, so it, it just, it really was the opportune time to kind of go, you know, Canada doesn't have this. Yeah. Canada doesn't have this this balanced voice about hunting and conservation and the history of this country that's just about Canada. And yeah. that was the premise that we built the show on um, to basically be be the voice, you know, of Canada. And because we live in British Columbia, like, I mean, yep. uh, a lot more stuff kind of goes on here um, and we're aware of more of it. So yeah, you know, our, we have more following here. Um, you know, about, I think it's like 53% of our North American followership is from British Columbia. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we just jumped in and never looked back. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, one of the things I I really love about what you guys do is it's sort of a, it's, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, it's kind of a no BS approach where you, you guys kind of tackle tackle these subjects in a thought provoking way that I think could make people um, on both sides reassess their opinion or, or their beliefs or whatever, whatever it is that they're holding. Um, and, and that's something that it like, I mean, the first few podcasts of you guys that I listened to, I, I came away from them like, yeah, this is, these are the conversations we need to be having. And this is, this is the stuff that, that guys need to be, need to be carrying that way they can be, you know, uh, the voice of hunting, like all hunters should be the voice of hunting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely what, you know, what we're trying to do is to tackle some of these you know, bigger issues. I mean, we don't always tackle issues, you know, per se, but, um, when we develop a show, we always do it with the listeners in mind. And I think what, what is the value exchange here? Like what, what are they getting out of their time? We're very cognizant of providing something to the listeners. If it's knowledge, if it's a perspective, if it's a call to action, if it's, something where they can go, Oh, I didn't know this about that before. Yeah. Like something, you know, I've always been an advocate that one of the most important things a hunter can do is, is just simply educate yourself about the issues. You don't have yeah. to have an opinion about it, but just educate yourself. So we're, we're trying to, you know, in part play that role for folks. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we're very cognizant of that value exchange. Yeah. I mean, and the, the entertainment fact, uh, value is there too. Um, like when I was doing research for this part of the podcast, when we get into some conservation stuff and the nitty gritty, I got distracted with one of your guys' podcasts that was about bighorn, like, you know, for two hours. So yeah, no, the, (laughs) the entertainment value is there for sure. It's, it's not all, it's not all nitty gritty conservation stuff, which is cool too. But, um, like I said, I, I do think you guys are really doing a service for, um, the British Columbia hunting community. Um, and and like the, like the point that you just made about, um, educating hunters, there's nothing worse than somebody arguing a point that doesn't know the facts about what they're trying to argue. Um, and you see it all the time online. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So, you know, even, you know, there's, there's facts about certain things where you can say like, okay, Hey, this is actually a, it's not actually B, 
Um, but then again, a, a lot of these things are not cut and dried, you know? So we sort of like, we'll paint both sides of the picture. Right. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, the one, the one episode we did on, uh, on wolves last, was that last summer, Curtis? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was like, uh, that was one of the series that we did kind of when COVID first hit. Yeah. Was- yeah. Where we couldn't have, we weren't face to face with guests and, uh, you know, kind of went into the whole history of human relationship with wolves, like worldwide, um, you know, species that went extinct. Yeah. We were poisoning them in British Columbia up until yeah. the late 1960s. And, you know, just as a way of saying, this is why the non-hunting public has this gut reaction to things like calls and hunting and trapping and stuff like that, because there's an entire history of humans across the earth and every continent that Europeans settled that there was a war waged against wolves. They were exterminated off the island of Japan because of the fear that they could give people rabies. Yeah, exterminated. Yeah a subspecies of the wolf off mm-hmm. of, you know, Japan. And, and so it was basically to just sort of say like, this is, can you understand why people have this reaction to like intensive wolf management and caribou recovery zones? And it's yeah. like, it's a, it's a raw point in human history, the way these animals were treated because they were, they, there was attempts to eradicate them. And some places they were successful and, and, you know, then on the other side, it's sort of like, okay, well, like, let's, you know, sort of talk about like, you know, wolf dynamics and predators and why people like to hunt them and stuff. And, you know, that episode, we literally had exactly like you said, we had people write to us and say, you know, I'm a hunter and I listened to that podcast and it really changed the way I thought about some things. And I had people that write up that were for better sake of the word, anti-hunters when it comes to wolves, but they wanted to talk to me about wolf conservation and the problem with wolves moving into communities and causing conflicts and stuff. And it was like, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of some of the things we try to hit on too is not change people's minds, but kind of like show multiple sides of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that, that brings us to an excellent segue. Um, and I don't know how long I have you guys for. So if we start going too long here, just let me know and we can, we can kill this thing and we can get back together again soon. But (laughs) um, yeah, no, that brings me to, to kind of a good segue with sort of where we're at today. Um, and, and, and I'd love to hear more hunting stories from you guys. And that's kind of what we normally do here, but I feel like it would be um, a major value add to talk to you guys about some of the stuff that's going on right now and some of the stuff that is circulated through social media um, and to try to give some understanding to some of the lay folks like myself um, who haven't maybe taken as much time as they ha- should have in the past or maybe just maybe just haven't had time to look at stuff. Um, so like right now there's the latest, um, wild sheep society call to action, which I think is a response to the paper that I had sent you. And I think you actually did a video on that paper too, right, Mark? Yeah, I did some videos in advance of the publication actually coming out in the journal. Yeah. Yeah. I think Robbie from Blood Origins referred to it as, what do you call it? The the Daramont problem, which is, was the author's last name, right? Yeah. One, one of the authors, there was a few authors on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he put out his analysis of the paper and the dangers that he saw in mm-hmm. um, some of the, the themes that were being promoted uh, in it as well. So he's a great thinker. Yeah, it's it's a pretty clever paper how it was put together. So when you read it on the surface, on your first pass of it, it doesn't seem very um, doesn't seem to be waging a war. And then you kind of get down into the nitty gritty and you look at the vernacular and you look how 
it sort of poses stuff and, and it starts talking about social license and the, the need to stop trophy hunting in order to keep hunting for meat being socially acceptable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Um, there's definitely some, there's some ideologies there that I think, you know, a hunter can accept because we've seen it unfold a lot almost every week right now that there's consequences to hunters inappropriate actions in the public forums. Right. Yeah. Um, so from that respect, society's acceptance of hunting is the social license contract. There's, there's certainly, you know, um, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. Um, social license was taken away on the grizzly bear hunt. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, hunters have to accept a lot of the responsibility for how the public perceived what the hunt was about. Um, you know, that, that, that led up to that, you know, but then, then there, then there is the paper fits into like what I think is a bigger, it's the, it's the long game here. Totally agree. Which is to is to put out and consistently publish papers like this, um, typically the the essay articles, which are reviewed for the elements of a logical argument, and that an author's putting forward some evidence to support their argument, but it doesn't it doesn't go through the rigor of a peer reviewed primary science article because no data is being presented um, and conclusions, you know, being drawn from a, from a unique data set. So these, these papers are somewhat easy to put out, introduce some concepts that just start to introduce language to plant seeds, to slowly kind of like build one thing on top of the next and, you know, successively build up, you know, this bigger and bigger volume of information that's, that's supporting a particular perspective. Um, yeah. you know, in this case on, on trophy hunting and trophy hunting being defined as, you know, carnivores. And so that's what I really picked up on this one. And I guess probably made a big deal about, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and sort of like, face value. Yeah. Maybe it didn't seem like a big deal. It's like, you know, but what I saw in that was, was the little seeds are being planted, the slight shift in language, the narrative and stuff, knowing that that organization in BC publishes these papers. Um, they actually sometimes have press releases prepared for when these papers come out yeah. In the scientific journals and they're in newslets, news outlets clear across the country um, ahead of time. And it's, it's a campaign. It's an advocacy campaign that's sort of made to look like it's science that's driving it. Right. So yeah, it, that's where I picked up on some of the things when I saw language about black bears, um, yeah. you know, when I saw language of like bighorn sheep kind of being tossed into there, it's like, this is the first time those things have been introduced into this forum and it's like, Mm -hmm. this is going somewhere and it's time to call it out. Yeah. It's an, it's, you know, another, uh, stroke of the knife in death by a thousand cuts. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, people have been using that analogy. Um, and you know, whether or not, um, people that are, behind these positions are interested in all hunting, you know, or whether they are just focused on the carnivores, uh, you know, I don't really know, Yeah, but there's definitely been a narrative developed about trophy hunting um, that goes beyond carnivores. And it goes to large antlered, large horned um, animals that are, you know, purposely selected and hunters mm-hmm. seek them out for, 
for these reasons and motives that are not for sustenance that yeah. gets defined as trophy hunting and it gets labeled as bad and and so i think it's bigger it's bigger than than just the carnivores it's the concept of what people want to define as trophy hunting because they yeah. think they know what the motives of the hunter are and trophy hunting in itself is inherently bad is is the philosophy so you know yeah so uh, a point I'd kind of like to touch on and get your um, kind of thoughts on, you know, we we say trophy hunting um, in air quotes a bit, right? Is isn't like doing some of these cat hunts and you know these other things? Isn't there a place for that in the conservation model um, with managing these species? I mean can't they easily be called conservation hunts? Well, I mean, they could, um, you know, there's, you know, there's always been a place in wildlife management worldwide and, you know, in North America where hunting gets used as a tool. Yeah. Um, you know, it's being used as a tool across North America right now in the fight against chronic wasting disease yep, because they're increasing the harvest of deer because one of the, the strategies against chronic wasting disease is reducing density, which is reducing the probability of infected animals from contacting uh, uninfected animals, right? So they're using mm -hmm. increased bag limits as the management tool. Um, predator management, yeah, there's there's some tools, you know, um, that hunting is used around that. But, but I'm also a realist in the sense that a tremendous amount of wildlife management, whether it is for predators or whether it's for ungulates, um, they're being managed because people want to hunt them and they mm -hmm. want to hunt them for their own personal reasons. And they like to be able to have enough out there to have the hunting experience. Um, I don't honestly believe that everybody is out there hunting because they believe they're a management tool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I guess more, more what I was getting at was from the, you know, biologists or the, the writers of the regulation, um, when they're considering what's harvested every year, are they are they looking at it like, you know, this many cats might get taken out of this area. That would do good. That would do bad. Well, there's there's definitely there's definitely that that is a management factor um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, you know, here in the Kootenays, we saw a change in the cougar seasons. Uh, a number of years ago, five, six years ago or something like that, where cat populations were getting really high. Um, you know, we were seeing sheep that were, or cats that were camping on bighorn sheep herds and, you know, kind of like every other day, like, you know, they were taking a, taking a sheep down. So when you got herds with 40 or 50 sheep in them, like you do the math over the course of the winter time, like it's, it, it was a real, a real yeah. thing, right? And, um, mule deer herds that were still trying to recover elk populations that were depressed, that were, they were trying to recover. And so, you know, they were looking at the numbers of cats that were being harvested, the, the time that it took to harvest the cat was going down, which is an indication, you know, another indicator, a metric of high cat populations, yeah. uh, all of these sorts of things. And they changed the season. Um, and opened it right up because they wanted to get cats reduced here yeah. in region four, uh, in, in the East Kootenay. So they pulled the female quota off. Got so it. that was a management decision that was based on having other wildlife objectives and using the data from past cougar harvests and, and reports and stuff to drive a change in the hunting season because they had a shift in objectives. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, that stuff is, 
is happening, you know, across all species, across all areas of the province. Yeah. Um, sometimes I mean, they're working on not the best of information. So. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's generally the, I, I mean, that's the counter argument you hear on a regular basis. You know, um, I often think about this stuff. Like if I had to explain this to my mother or my aunt, but what's, what's the rationale I give her as the, the, the non late, the non, the non hunting opinion, the non, the, that lens, you know what I mean? Um, and the reasoning behind it, I mean, you often hear people go there, right? Yeah. A, and that's, that's the million dollar question on, you know, on some of these, um, hunts that we have in, in the province, right? Like it's, it's trying to articulate that to the non-hunting public in a way that resonates. Yeah. And I don't think hunters have done a really good job. They didn't do a good job during the grizzly bear debate. No. You know, that's for sure. Cause everything that was being put forth obviously didn't change anybody's, you know, um, yeah. op opinions about anything, but you know, the, the grizzly bear hunt is the example was hunters were not able to articulate why they wanted to, or did hunt a grizzly bear. Yeah. Personally, what was the personal story, the personal motives, the personal reasons people the mo for most the most part i saw people that could not reach within themselves and explain that to others probably because they didn't know themselves why why this was important to them um so you saw a lot of arguments out there it's like well the big boars um they kill the cubs so when you take the big boars out then you're yeah. actually saving cubs and it's like well almost half the provincial harvest every year were sows. Yeah. You know, the average age of the boars was, was quite young. Um, you know, so there were, you know, there were things like that and it's sort of like, well, you know, grizzly bears are serious predators of, you know, moose calves and stuff. So you got to keep their numbers down. But our ad management system was designed so that hunting never caused a population decrease. Yeah. As soon as there was, too many bears, females in a given grizzly bear management unit that were shot, the hunt was shut down because the management objectives were for that hunting would never be a cause of a grizzly bear population decline. So it was, you know, it was sort of argument after argument was put out there that the non-hunting public countered mm -hmm. and, and hunters just couldn't say, I like hunting grizzly bears. For these reasons, like a story, like I just told about the elk, yeah. you know, and, and at, the, at that kind of personal level, that story was not told. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's part of what we got to get better at. Yeah. So looking back, I mean, what are we coming up on that ban was in 2018. So I'm neither of us are any good at math. So whatever that was looking back at that now in, in, in retrospect, um, do you think there was anything that us as the hunting community could have done differently to, um, to stop that, that ban from happening? And I know, I know you said in a recent podcast too, you said that that effort had been going on since the seventies and it had died down and come back up and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, and I do believe that was probably one of the failures um, in, in assessing what were the causes of those, those movements back in the 70s and the 80s. What, what were the questions? What were the narratives? What was the non-hunting public not accepting of? Um, the science, the fact that, um, you know, meat wasn't retained. It was very obvious from, you know, pictures and websites and stuff that hunters were hunting these things for, for skull measurements and, and 
taxidermy mounts, there was no conversation whatsoever about the meat, the food, the food value, the nutritional content of the wild game, packing out, a, you know, bear meat, all this kind of stuff. There were people doing it, yeah, um, but the story was not being told. And we were given the signals, you know, 40 years ago that that should probably be the change in the narrative uh, and the practices. And we never heeded that. And yeah. you can't change that in a matter of months, you know, when when it hit again and the same thing is kind of happening right now in the province with the wolves, right? Mm -hmm. like it's, it's a whole entire history of, you know, social media and websites and how they're sold on outfitters websites and stuff that, you know, the uncertainty and the population estimates, because there's no research put into, you know, um, updating or or increasing the certainty around population predictions so there, there's all these things that are forming the narrative that are challenging hunters to explain why you're doing this that our past our past way of coming across to the non-hunting public is is already said a lot and yeah. it's hard right now to change gears and tell a different story because we never again, never heeded the, the signals. Yeah. Black yeah. bears is different. I feel across North America, there has been a huge shift in how hunters talk about black bears mm -hmm. and their primary motives. And it is, it is now a conversation that completely revolves around food yeah, and bear meat and bear harvest and the value of it. Um, pictures, how people talk on social media, like they're literally talking about black bears, like they do venison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's making a difference. They're, they're the you, new white tail deer. Yeah, totally. Do you, do oh, you think totally. like the, do you think like the pop, uh, the popularity of guys like Steve Ranella have played a big factor there? Cause like, uh, again, talking about looking at hunting through non hunting glasses or lenses rather, um, that's who people know about that. Like Ranella has positioned himself to be the face of hunting in a lot of ways. Um, whether you love him or hate him, like if you go to the grocery store and talk to somebody about hunting, they're like, Oh yeah, I've seen it on Netflix. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, he's had a huge impact on, um, how hunters behaved, how hunters perceived certain things changed hunters actions and changed non hunters understanding of hunting because his focus has been on, this is how I hunt. This is what it means to me. Yeah. Um, he always tells it from the first person. This is how yeah. I do it. This is what it means to me. This is, this is, this is why I like to eat this. This yeah. tastes like this and that tastes like that, right? Like it's it's always, it's always, you know, this is how one person sees the world. Um, but the way he does that resonates. Um, I remember one of the stories that was told about him um, was, you know, he, he really started championing like different cuts on animals and how yeah. you utilize them and the whole thing with the shank, right? A mm -hmm. lot of times they were either just left in the bush, like from the, from the knuckle, the um, knee joint down or the elbow yeah. joint down. Um, or it was the meat was just carved off and thrown in with the hamburger pile, which was yeah. fine. It was still getting, getting used. But I remember a story about, him somewhere in the Eastern States and he was hunting whitetails or something. He went through a game check and the wildlife officers at the game check were sort of like, Oh, Hey, it's Steve Rinella or whatever. And, you know, did their thing. And they said, you know, since you've kind of come mainstream mm -hmm. at the game checks, we've seen a complete change in hunters bringing out the entire leg portions of the deer now. Yep. He said before they always used to see the hunters coming out with it cut off at the knee and elbows. Yeah. And just because of his advocacy of how good that was, if it's cooked this way, 
changed hunters. Yeah. So. People are going to start accusing me of being a Ranella lover. I just had Tree Hearn on here. He, he, I think he's the episode before you guys and we got into a Ranella conversation. So I, I, I definitely don't want to go down that rabbit <laughs> hole too far, but I, but I, I mean, think the important thing there is it shows you the power that one person can have. Totally. And like, not everybody has got, you know, like a huge budget behind them to, to put this stuff out there, but yeah. it doesn't matter. And it's almost irrelevant in a way because the power to change society is probably more in the hands of hundreds of thousands of hunters than one person. Yeah. Because they're learning how to tell a story and to tell the hunting story differently. Yep. And if he were run over by a bus tomorrow, but everybody sort of said, this is how he tells the hunting story. And that's how everybody told their hunting story, even though it would be slightly different. Mm -hmm. The trajectory of where the future of hunting is going would probably go in a better place. So, yeah. And, uh, that's sort of where I wanted to take this with, um, you know, bringing up Renella and then bringing up kind of the individual accountability of the image that everybody's putting out into the world. And I mean, the listeners of this podcast are going to start getting tired of it because it's almost every episode I bring it up. And it's like, I don't know, it's like my way of sublimity, subliminally messaging to people like, hey, the image that you project into the world is the image that becomes people's reality, right? Like people's perception of what you're doing on social media is what they think that you do. And it's just like, if, if we can, if we can do, if we can do stuff on social media that, that is helping our cause and not hurting it, um, you know, like we could refer to the the lady on Vancouver Island that got this wolf thing kicked off. Um, if we're all putting our best foot forward, we're going to be in a lot better shape, right? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, I, me I remember a coworker one time said something to me that kind of stuck. And uh, he said, uh, perception is reality. Yeah. So you can say, this is what I mean, or this is how I do something, or this is what I intended. And in some ways it doesn't matter. It's how the people or the person that was receiving that, how they perceived it. That's what matters, how your message is perceived. Right. Yeah. And that's why Robbie Kroger has championed this cause is ask yourself the question is what you're doing, helping hunting or hurting hunting as seen through the lens of a non-hunter. Yeah. And that, that's that exact philosophy because the game that we're in right now, the, the public relations game, which is a huge part of what it is right now, mm -hmm. is about how our message is received. And so much of what we've done in messaging is messaging to each other. But the world's watching all of us doing that and like you, you could post a picture of, you know, like a sheep, the doll sheep that you got up North or whatever. And you just post yep. and go, here's my sheep. And it's got a bunch of blood on it. Cause it's white and you know, like blah, blah, blah. And you can just say like, man, this was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And it's yeah. like, we all know what you mean. Like we can feel that we know that experience. You don't need to show us that experience because we know what you've just been through. Mm -hmm. But to the non-hunting person, they don't. Yeah. And that's where we failed is we're not telling that whole story. They just see this culmination at the end of it and they don't, they don't get it right. Mm -hmm. So they're forming a narrative or a perception to fill in the blanks. Yeah. And we're going like, no, 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 no. No, that's not what it meant. I packed the meat of the sheep off the mountain and took me three trips and yeah. they're like that it, it's too late. Yeah. Right? I mean, you like to quote Snyder, you can't get the toothpaste back into the tube either. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, on uh, that podcast yeah. you guys did with, um, I think it was with Britt Longoria. Um, she was talking about... I think it was the podcast with her. I don't know. I've listened to so many of them in the last week since we started talking, but uh, 
I, I think it was her. She was talking about um, telling the story um, and not just posting a grip and grin. She was talking about, you know, sh- showing the, like, we were, it was specifically about hunts in Africa and she was talking about. That was about, Robbie Kroger. Oh, was it um, Robbie? Yeah. Yeah. On episode 40. So he, he was challenging hunters to think about, about what that, end result of a hunt was yeah what was the tangible outcome Mm -hmm. and one of the things that's causing us grief with social media and hunting is the defining moment of the hunt is the grip and grin and so he's challenging hunters that if hunting means all these different things to you and it and it is more than just that animal that you got yeah then figure out how to show that so that someone who isn't a hunter gets it and he used the example of like a hunter that went to africa and harvested an elephant and rather he said rather than the defining culmination of the hunt being the picture of the hunter with the tusks yeah is it with it was with the chief of the nearby community who said what the harvesting of that elephant meant to his people. Yeah. That yeah. was, let's just call it, that's the trophy. Yeah. So he's challenging people to look for that thing that's so important to that hunt. It's almost like, it's like if you went on a hunt and it was like the epic hunt of your lifetime and you did not get anything. Yeah. Yeah. That is still maybe your most memorable hunt. How would you show people that without, yeah. without an animal? And it's sort of like the hunts that you get an animal with still have that somewhere in that hunt. And it's like bringing that to the forefront of our story is what Robbie was challenging us with. Yeah. And, and it, it'll, <laughs> I, I mean, conveying our stories that way, will truly change the perception of hunting. I think like when I was listening to that, I was just nodding my head, you know, (laughs) like, um, recently on here, I had the owner of the archery shop that I deal with, um, Lucien, who happens to be a South African guy too. Um, and he's not a hunter. Um, and the first thing he said when we were talking is he goes, Oh man, I really like your podcast. It's like in the first minute of the podcast, because I really like your podcast because you guys are showing what it takes, like how much work these guys are putting in and how the, I don't think he used the word trophy, but I think he said like the, the payoff at the end of your season is not even just the animal in the freezer. It's the, the, the long story of adventure and experiences and hard work and effort building up to it. Um, it's not just meat in the freezer, right? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, one of the, my favorite books, um, is called meditations on hunting and it was written by, um, um, Jose Ortega, Igase, um, Spanish hunter philosopher wrote it down, wrote, wrote about, about hunting and he has a really good, he has a really good, um, narrative in there that explains what hunting is nice and basically he said you know sort of paraphrasing that hunting is what one species does to take possession of another species or what what individual does to take possession of another species that's what hunting is yeah you're taking possession of another living thing. And he said, hunting doesn't actually always culminate in the death of the animal that's taken because throughout human history, that's how animals were domesticated is hunters actually took possession of the wild animals Mm -hmm. and brought them back alive. And that's how we started to then change them to domestication through, through breeding and stuff. Right. So like he said, that was still hunting. Yeah. Um, taking possession uh, of the animal. And the reason that that's always resonated from me is because the whole notion of trying to define 
hunting by all of these different things. You're a meat hunter, you're a trophy hunter, you're a this hunter, that hunter, a selective hunter, whatever. I'm like, there really is no such a thing. Yeah. Because the purest form of the definition of hunting, which is, in my opinion, is gase, is hunting is what one thing does to take possession of another. If it's to eat it, it's to, if it's to take the fur to keep warm, if it like w- the reason, the motive is different for every hunter, but the act of hunting is simply that. And then he also went on to say the hunt is not hunting. The hunt are the traditions and rituals and activities that the hunter undertakes while hunting. And it's usually those traditions and rituals of the hunt that are the most meaningful to the hunter. Setting up the camp, going out, going to the same place, the sunrise in the morning, that's the hunt. Hunting is what you do when you take possession of the the other thing. And it's like... So that's when we tell the story about the hunt Yep, is different than the possession picture at the end of it. Well, I mean, like when we trade hunting stories, when we're, when we're in camp or we're doing a podcast and I sit down with Curtis and Mark and we talk hunting stories, there's the perfect, perfect example of that, you know, about an hour ago here in this, in this podcast, I asked you guys for a hunting story and you know what? about two seconds of each of those stories was the animal hitting the ground. And we, 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 we kind of glossed right over the animal and we talked more about the experience. And those are the stories that we trade. And there's no reason that can't be what we put out in the world either. Right? No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, Curtis knows this cause he used to love it when our families went, was in camp because it's like everybody would sit around and they'd be laughing and reflecting on the old days and stuff. And there were all these stories in our family that had nothing to do with somebody getting something. (laughs) Yeah. Man, it's, it's so true. Like I I always bring them up. People are going to start thinking he's fake because I I have to convince him to come on here. But, but Ronnie, my hunting mentor, um, I mean, I volunteer to go to work with him when we're doing out of town jobs and stuff like that, just so I can sit in the truck and listen to his stories, you know, like they're just, just hunting stories are the coolest and they generally don't have anything to do with the, the, the animal. They're about getting stuck on the side of a mountain somewhere and living under a sheep tarp for nine days and almost dying and everything else. You know what I mean? And see in our podcast with Brittany uh, Longoria on Monday, like we were talking about that and storytelling, storytelling is like the earliest form of human communication. So language was developed about a hundred thousand years ago yeah. and the way, he, the way humans communicated when language is developed was through story. That's how information and knowledge was transferred was through story. And story is, what'd you do today? Well, I started in the morning here and I went on this journey through the day and I ended up here at nighttime. That's a story. Began in the past, moves into the future. And it's got some point to the story. It has a lesson. It has a moral. And in storytelling, that was a matter of life and death because through the story, you were saying, this is how I got the animal. So the next person could go, okay, now I know how to do it too. This is where I found good food. This is how I got through that mountain pass, like whatever escaped, you know, such and such. Um, Story is genetically hardwired into the human's brain. And hunters, when they came back from the hunt, did two things. They told the story as a way of teaching others about what they learned on that journey. Yeah. And they also made the connection for the people that were going to eat that on how that came about because that was important to the culture. Yeah. So 
in all of us, because we're hunters, we're that small percentage of the human population that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. We're the hunters, but we're the storytellers. Those two things go hand in hand. Yeah. And you can take any hunter of any age, take them out on a hunt for the day, come back after supper, sit around the campfire and say, so tell me what happened today. Yep. And they are the most amazing TEDx storytellers that you've <laughs> ever seen. But we've, we've lost or we have yet to develop the ability to do that in snippets with pictures <laughs> on social media. That is probably the biggest gap that we need to learn as hunters, as storytellers, is to tell the rest of the society these stories through these pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we need to start a, uh, a social media campaign or a push where your entire hunting season, you don't post any of the <laughs> animals yet. Yeah. It's gotta be, it's gotta be some other highlight or yeah. And go ahead. Every day. This is what I would challenge people to do is start learning to tell the story of being a hunter. And that's going to start with if if you've got an open like Instagram account, like not a private account, um, yeah. you know, it, it's different, but maybe people that have private ones, like a whole bunch of their friends um, aren't hunters, but they're following what they're doing. So use the opportunity starting in the summertime to say, hi, my name's Mark. You've been following me for a while. Each day I'm going to show you something about Mark in my everyday life. So you're going to get to know me as a person, what's important, what I'm worried about, what I do, what my day looks like. You're going to start to follow me as I get ready for hunting season. And you're going to follow me on this journey of hunting season. And it may end up with a harvested animal or it may not. Yeah. So just think of one post a day starting July or August. And ending on the last day of hunting season, could you imagine how beautifully every single person could say, this is who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And people are like, wow, that looks like somebody I'd like to know. Didn't know that guy was a dad, you know, or, or something like that. Right. Yeah. And follow you on that whole, that whole journey. They would have a lot different understanding of a hunter and hunting than, yeah. you know, Hey, got the six point bull. <laughs> on the 21st of September. And that's yeah. all you saw. The pictures before that was like your friend's wedding and, yeah. you know, like yeah. in the 80 pictures of your dog. And then all of a sudden it's like, wham. Hashtag like, Hoy. Oh, what a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Z z zero meaning. No, I, I, uh, I've been trying to make a, f a point of, um, I, I did post a grip and grin this past season just cause I was, I was pumped that I, I got a deer down with Ron and it was really meaningful and important to me. Um, but that being said, I've been making a point of, of trying to share how much time in the field it takes to find, um, uh, success if you want to measure success by, you know, harvesting an animal and the amount of, the amount of failure that comes to, right. I've been trying to share that. Um, and I think in my own personal circle, I think it's helped. I think I get a lot of, I get a lot of feedback from people that are like, Hey, like that was a really cool story you shared on the podcast, or that was a cool post you made about <laughs> getting your ass absolutely handed to you for 10 days and not, and not shooting anything and, and how much it sucked. Right. One of the, uh, experiences I've had, which is really cool is Curtis is a professional photographer and he's come on some of our hunts, um, like came on, on the archery hunt last year. Cause you weren't there the whole season. You came out for a portion of it. Um, when we were out and then he photographed, um, when we were hunting, but it, it's like, it's completely up to him to photograph what he sees, to capture the hunt. 
And when you, when somebody else photographs you rather than, than you taking your own pictures, they're seeing it from seeing you hunting from the outside. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it, at the end of it, when I look back at all of his pictures, it's the story. He captured that, but it's not how I would have done it. Yeah. And I mean, one of the most memorable pictures, remember the day we got soaked, Curtis? Oh yeah. Is and you got the, the picture, picture of, of you me ringing, ringing your sock my sock out. out. Like you're like, who the <laughs> hell would take a picture of the guy ringing a sock out, right? But it's like, it that, says so much. Any Anybody could look at that picture, whether you're a hunter or not, and you could know they just spent a hell of a time getting absolutely soaked, so soaked that it's like he actually has to wring his socks out. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> paints the picture of it's like what you actually go through and kind of what the, the whole experience can be. And the beautiful part about that is like, just it's the talent of a photographer to like, see what's in front of them is just think of how many people who do outdoor activities that don't hunt that could relate to that picture. They've been there. Yeah. And all of a sudden, instantly, you've got a whole bunch of people that aren't hunters that are actually identifying with something in a hunter's world. And it's like, that's closing the gap. Yeah. They're getting into the hunter's world and going like, oh yeah, I know what that feels like. And now all of a sudden we can talk, we can relate, right? So. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, it's important. Um, and, and the spaces I think in a lot of ways are closer together than a lot of people on both sides think. Um, like a, a, a lot of people just don't have a basic understanding. Like they don't even have a high level understanding of what hunting is, what it means, how it works. Like generally when you talk to people that are uninitiated and uninitiated from at least my perspective, they just think you hop in a pickup truck, drive out to the woods and shoot a deer. And that's the end of it. Few of those lucky bastards do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, neither of us are them. I'm eh? always like, I'm always like when that happens, I'm like, great. Until you can do that every single year, year (laughs) after year, and show consistency and the fact that that's skill, then it's just shithouse luck. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. But I mean, that, that again, you know, your perception is your reality and that's a lot of people's perception. I mean, the, the stuff on TV for many years, um, hasn't helped either because a lot of that stuff is like highlight reel after highlight reel, you know? And it's like, they don't show the guide or outfitter that's been on those animals for 30 days before buddy rolls up in his a uh, hundred thousand dollar truck and gets it done with the camera crew. Right. It's a very, it's a very tough way to tell the true story of hunting in 22 minutes, a yeah, 10 day yeah. trip, a five day trip. Absolutely. And even, I mean, even meat eater, like they've, they've got, you know, their same sort of format, 22 minutes, but they incorporate quite a bit more in the fact that they usually do some sort of meal with, you know, you know, like the first, the first 12, 12 minutes is the hunt. And then, you know, they do something else where there was the one where they went out doing catfish and then you know the last 10 minutes was him you know half the episode he was at at the guy's house and they were cooking it up and then yeah. they had you know, a big family fish fry and there's they kind of touch on that a little bit more giving it more than just that highlight reel yeah and you can, you can definitely see that shift in how people talk and behave in the hunting community since that sort of shift has been made yeah. Away from the highlight reel, it's kind of more along the lines of eat and hunt to eat and yep. all of that. It's not just whack them, stack them, sort of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it, again, it speaks to that same thing we've been talking about where, I mean, the three of us are, are dyed in the wool hunters and 
you know, if, if we go on a backpack trip and spend 10 days back there, some of our favorite time is going to be in the tent at night, just chatting, doing exactly what we're doing right now. Right. Yep. Yeah. And so that's why, that's why I kind of have that, uh, maybe this need, we got to give it a name. So there's all these, <laughs> all these hunt challenges, right? Like get fit for hunt challenge and the yeah. super archery totally. mountain challenge or whatever, all of these things. So this, this is the storytelling cha- challenge, right? Yeah. Is start like dedicate like one post a day, start in the late summer, letting, getting people to know who you are and then take them on a journey of your hunting season. Yeah. One of the key elements of a storyteller is uh, a storyteller has the power to elicit um, brain activity in the, in the way that the neurons fire in the brain and actually how the brain releases hormones. A good storyteller can actually control those things. One of the hormones that's released is called um, dopamine. Yeah. And dopamine increases focus increases memory and creativity of the people receiving the story. And one of the ways that a good story does that is you keep people following the story. They're waiting for the next step in the story. And I did a series of these a couple of years ago where there were nine posts, nine days of the nine day archery season and each day was a scenario where I had the bull that I couldn't get. <laughs> people followed that thing because they're waiting for, oh, he pulled it, he pulled it through on the ninth day, right? Didn't work yeah. out. But it's like I could just I could I could measure the dopamine in everybody that was following that because they were there every single day waiting for the next day to see what <laughs> happened, right? And that's a good storyteller because you got people engaged in their following with you, but they're they're following a good, a good story. So like, that's the challenge. Take people on a journey yeah. of your entire hunting season. Yeah. And so to kind of bring stuff right around, um, one of the things we've been talking about here is, is that, um, kind of protecting the hunter image and protecting, you know, um, the 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 perception of hunters from non hunters and like making sure that social license as much as i hate to use that term now um doesn't go well, anywhere a, that's a, it's a real thing like yeah social acceptability of hunting is a real thing um yeah. going back to the social license to hunt paper the premise that i did not agree with cuz the evidence wasn't presented in it is because the public disagrees with hunting carnivores, cougars, bulls, whatever that they want to keep it restricted to doesn't mean that all hunting's at risk. Generally, the non-hunting public in North America is completely fine with hunters for food. And case after case after case, if the non-hunting public is concerned about something, they go after the thing they're concerned about, which was the grizzly bear hunt. They strictly went after it because they just saw it as a trophy hunt. They weren't after the moose hunt. They weren't after the, you know, the, the all that sort of stuff. So, mm-hmm. so there's an aspect of the social license thing that you, we've got to be aware yep. of individuals that are trying to steer a narrative somewhere. Um, but we also have to realize that maintaining social license for the vast majority of the North American or Canadian population probably isn't as hard as what we think it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, before we move on from the grizzly thing, I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't remember which podcast it was because I've listened to all of them recently <laughs> again. Um, but in one of the podcasts you said y- you, you spat off a fact um, that well, surprised me. And it was that no, no grizzlies die of natural causes. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so in, in the, in the southern half of BC right now, um, the leading cause of grizzly bear mortality is from um, human conflict because of attractant management mm-hmm. and collisions with cars and trains. Yeah. So the whole. So over the last, 
Uh, I'm just trying to remember the, how how large the data set spans, like the last 40 years or something like that, of all the different researchers that have collared grizzly bears and done studies in the southern half of British Columbia. Yeah. Um, every single grizzly bear that's been studied, there's never been one that's died of natural causes. All of the bears and studies that have died have all died of because of humans. Yeah, and and that's... the leading leading causes now are are non hunting. Well, because there is no hunting, right? Yep. Yeah, that's wild. So, that, that... so, so one of the arguments, you know, was, well, it's like hunting was one of the causes of the mortality. So why not just stop it? And then we'll try to fix these other things. And it's like, well, it was, hunting was always stopped when the mortality of grizzly bears in a grizzly bear management unit got too high. So it was never an issue during the hunt and it never would have been an issue now. So if you're strictly concerned about grizzly bear mortality, taking yep. hunting out of the picture didn't change anything because all those other causes yeah. we have just about no control over. Yeah. Wacy, um, who he hosts the traditional Tuesdays with me on this podcast, but uh, Wacy, he's in Alberta. So he, I mean, they haven't had a, the grizz hunt, I think since 08, I think it is. Um, yep. and he was saying he, he's convinced they don't like these, these advocacy groups or whatever that, that really went after the grizzly. He's convinced that they don't care, uh, about, you know, grizzly mortality. They just don't want people to hunt them. There, there is a part of that. And there's a part of that that's embedded in all carnivore hunting. There's a part of that that's embedded in any hunting. It's people that just fundamentally disagree with killing wild animals. Yeah. Um, there's the ones that fundamentally disagree with, you know, like wolves because it's like they know it's not a sustenance animal. Yeah. Um, so they object to that. And then there's people that are just, they're sort of like, no, you shouldn't be killing, you know, anything. So, so yeah, um, there is that philosophy that exists out there and it's real. People hold that philosophy. It is yeah. what it is. Um, uh, I just wish they would be just more upfront about it. Just saying like, Hey, this is just a philosophy and a belief that I hold, uh, as opposed to trying to come at it by making up what a hunter's motives were. They just like to kill. Um, they're harvesting too many bears. The government doesn't have very good population numbers, so you actually don't know what you're doing. It's just sort of like, yeah, just kind of stop with all that stuff and just say like, hey, I disagree with it on moral, ethical, philosophical principles. Yeah, so that brings me to a video that you posted a couple of days ago. I think it was February 28th that you posted it, and it's um, it's on Instagram on your personal page or your your uh, your Mark Hall Instagram, but it says the, the, the caption on it is social license to anti hunt. And, and, mm -hmm. and a really, it's a really interesting video. And I'd urge everybody listening to this to, uh, hop over there and, <clears throat> and check it out. Um, after this, it, it's, you, you make some, some really good points and it's points that, that I often worry about. And, um, you know, raising a bunch of kids and a bunch of kids that all they want to do is be in the woods and stuff. It's something that I think about, you know, like this, this cyber bullying thing. And then because it's hunting, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely what's happening out there, right? It yeah. Is the entire spectrum of, um, advocating violence against another person, abuse, racism, sexism, misogamy, like it's all happening in that community being levied at hunters, death threats, yeah. um, the whole thing. And it's just, it's tolerated and it's accepted. Like it just, it is, you know, like I said in that video, it's the, it's the cause of the gap between 
anti-hunters and non-hunters. And it's like, if you want to close that gap and talk about conservation, then you need to get past this tolerance and acceptance, acceptance and promoting that this type of hate and abuse and cyberbullying is accepted if it's as long as it's levied against a hunter. And I'm, I'm just like, absolutely not. It doesn't matter who or what or whatever. Yeah. It is completely unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's like, like you're saying it's accepted. It's unacceptable on, on both sides too. Right. You know, and here's something I didn't talk about in this video that it's always deep, deeply concerned me about the community that advocates against hunting that is perpetuating this level of cyberbullying and abuse and violence and wishing for all these horrible ways that a hunter could die and karma and all the shit that you see going on out there is kids see this stuff. Yeah. And it's like, it's being done in this day and age, the internet, it's in full view of kids. And there are enough tragic cases in the world of children being influenced by what adults are doing and saying and writing mm -hmm. and producing in major motion pictures and writing in novels that have driven kids to go to school with a firearm and commit horrible things. Yeah. And I honestly, I, I fear to God that some kid that's watching and listening to all of this stuff is going to know that there's kids in his class who are hunters like Curtis that started when he was 10. Yeah. Everybody in his school knew that he hunted, right? Yeah. Um, that he's going to come from a family that's got problems that hate that kind of stuff. Maybe use that kind of language at home. Yeah. And the kid's going to be driven to do something like that. And it's like, imagine how everybody in the community is going to feel if that were to ever happen. And if I'm to, to say there's any reason why this needs to stop in the entire forums of hunting is for that one reason that we never have to have a candlelight vigil for, for kids yeah. at a school. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, honestly, it doesn't even ma matter matter the topic. Like, it, it's unacceptable on all levels, and it, it's the stuff that comes out of uh, um, out of some of these echo chambers, you know, on Facebook and everything else. And you get screenshots sent to you. It's like, I, it's it's. I mean, your mouth just hits the floor. You can't believe some of these people are, are you know, like real, right? And stuff stays up there. Yeah. Yeah. Like how does it not get deleted? The site owners don't pull it down. The platforms don't pull it down. Yeah. You know, like I, I said in my, in my op-ed video there last week, it's like, you know, one of the mainstream news articles that was writing about this stuff going, you know, um, you know, Hey, these people were expressing outrage yeah. over wolf hunting. So yeah, you know, like it's more than outrage. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, um, it's, it, it's wild. It's wild. I, I, I don't, I don't understand. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, I guess you and I are just not the, the type of, the type of dudes that would ever take it there anyways, uh, in an argument, because we both know when you, when you act like that, it doesn't help your case in the first place. So. Nope, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess one of the, uh, one of the last things I have on my notepad here was going to be just to bring up like, what are some of the, kind of immediate threats that you see to hunting and, and kind of our ability to hunt going forward. Um, and we, we've touched on a ton of them already. I mean, we've spent the better part of this podcast talking conservation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's a few different places. Um, there is definitely 
there is definitely a threat that comes from these organizations that are weaponizing science against hunting. Yeah. And you got to be hyper aware of when that happens, where it happens, what the media does with it when it's when it's picked up because from what I've learned from people that know a bit more about some of these things that's going on that there are very wealthy individuals out there that have perspectives about right and wrong and wildlife and hunting and trapping and all this kind of stuff. And they got the money to do these sorts of things, to pay people to write things, to pay people to put things in journals, to pay professional people to have polished uh, press releases in every news outlet in the country in advance of um you know, publications coming out, all this sort of stuff. So there's this super powerful like element out there. And it's, 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 it's down to just like a handful of individuals, but they got so much money and so much power. They get involved in elections, making sure that certain parties and individuals and ridings don't get elected because they might you know, reverse a grizzly bear ban decision if they got in, into office or, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. you got to be really aware of that game and probably as big or probably bigger threat is how the masses in the middle. So you've got these spectrums, right? You got hardcore live to see the day all hunting stops. And then, you know, the other end, it's just like, you know, defend all hunting at all costs sort of thing. But in the middle, yeah. there's this, the 80% of the population is in the middle that just needs information, balanced information to make up their own mind. So yeah. if they're not getting our true story or if they're not getting the facts or if they're not getting the perspective, then they're going to develop their reality based on their perception of it. Right. Yeah. And to me, that may be the biggest threat is, is that middle group is not understanding. They're not hearing and they're not seeing what they see doesn't resonate with them or what we say and our behaviors and actions don't make sense to that group of people. Yeah. Then, then those are the people that have powers in election, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah that's one, that's the ahead. big thing, and and that's and that's where the individual person really has the power to make the difference because it's like it it's your closest circle of friends that you have the ability to influence. Yeah. And totally. say no, I know a hunter, and that's not what they're like. So what I see on the news. I, I can call bullshit on that. That's kind of what we want the non-hunter to be able to do going, no, my neighbor's a hunter and he's not like that. And, or she's not like that. And it's like, so yeah, pff, I don't agree with any of that stuff I see out there. Yeah. And but part of the dilemma for me too, is like, you go, you turn on the, the six o'clock news now or whatever. And how much of it is, you know, an opinion piece now and how much of it is fact it's like it's it's hard for people already to to wade through the bs and and then you get on a topic like this when uh, you know the the majority of the stuff that they're getting um through a google search is a lot of these you know uh, I don't know how I would say it, like anti-hunting groups or, or anti-hunting lobbies, you know, that's like, that's the grand majority st of stuff that comes up, you know, you, d you don't really see a lot of like feel good hunting stories when you, you know, if you're Googling around or if you're just looking up, you know, hunting in the news, like that's not what makes, that's not what makes the head, the headlines. And, um, I think that's a component of what we need to change. Definitely, because that's that's the information that that non-hunting mass in the middle is using t 
to form its opinion about hunting, right? Is yeah. what's available. And it's probably one of the downfalls of the hunting community is we're not organized enough and spent enough effort getting allies on our side that have enough money and philanthropists that are hunters that are willing to put huge dollars behind saying every week this organization with a positive hunting message facts about hunting is going to be on the desk of every newslet in the country every week mm-hmm. or every day you know like it's just it news news outlets make up stories based on what they have on files too right yeah so right now the narrative that the media is creating is based on the information they're getting because hunters aren't playing the same game. And, you know, and objectively you can step back and look at what the non hunting community or the anti hunting community is doing. And, and I'm, and sometimes I'm like, God damn, they're good at what they do. Yeah. Like really yeah. they are, you know, they don't fight amongst themselves. You know, you don't see them ripping apart each other in social media going, no, there's nothing wrong with trapping wolves. It's hunting wolves that we should be about. No, you were just the, you should die by a thousand deaths, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, but you go on, on, look at what hunters say about each other and God from the outside world, you're just like, oh my God. Oh. But yeah, we don't have press releases going out. We don't, we're not, you know, doing all that same stuff to be successful. So. We are yeah. losing that game. Yeah, I, I've said on here often too. It's it's shocking the willingness of people in our own community um, to to cannibalize the stuff that they're passionate about, um, like regularly. Like, I mean, if you if you're getting into archery, you'll you'll soon see, or you've probably already seen that you know that archery community. Um, some of the traditional guys only want to have have the opportunity be for traditional guys, you know, and they're willing to um, write all kinds of stuff on the internet about you know modern compound equipment and how it's unethical and this and that, with the complete disregard for. Um, the non-hunting optics of it. Wait a minute, new compounds shoot themselves and they have laser range finders built into the site. Oh, that's not fair for the elk, you know? And, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's just a slippery slope and I think it needs to be a, a united front on this stuff, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the point of having the debate about what's an ethical weapon in an archery season when there's no longer a season because it can't, there isn't enough animals to support, you know, the hunt. Yeah. I mean, when you look around the province and see the magnitude of some of the population de- declines like black tailed deer on Vancouver Island. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, one of, one of my friends is actually, I think in his thesis work, he's, he was compiling information that shows what the actual tonnage of meat that's been lost from families' freezers in British Columbia due to population declines. I'm like, it's staggering. Oh, wow. Staggering. Like when you look at it in that terms. Yeah. Going like that's, that's 22,000 tons of deer that have not been in hunters freezers over the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. You know, so it's like, that's, that's what we should be talking about. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think we've covered the bases here and I think, um, I think everybody that listens to my podcast should definitely take the time to, uh, search up the hunter, um, conservationist and, Go over there and see what Mark and uh, Curtis are up to. They have, um, I mean, you guys have all the latest conservation stuff up on your page on a daily basis. And you guys are always um, putting out thought provoking stuff that will make you uh, make everybody think hard and and do the right thing. And you guys are helping, uh, helping 
keeping hunting going here in BC and um, giving us the ammo that we need, like I said at the very beginning of this. No, appreciate yeah, that. Thanks, man. It's part, partly what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's huge. And and they're both entertaining dudes too. So that's 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 another reason to go check them out. But uh, <laughs> no. I uh I thank you guys very much for coming on and um this has been a good informative session and I'd love to have you back on again soon and hopefully yeah, yeah hopefully next time we're uh getting seasons back instead of having people try to take them away, maybe. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to get a squirrel season in BC. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I, I, I hit your form. I gave her the thumbs up. I'm in. Good deal. Yeah. Right Good on. Good deal. Cool. Right on. And there'll guys. still, there'll still be people that will just go out and drive down the road and get a squirrel in the middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be off in the, off in the mountains and can't find one. Yeah. There's also people that'll be really upset about hunting while eating their McNuggets. So different strokes for different <laughs> folks. Absolutely. Now it's been a great time. We've uh, enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Wilderness Locals or check out the gear at our website, www.wildernesslocals.net. 